All right, folks, so in this video, uh, we're going to continue talking about fingerprint features. Uh, the last couple of videos, we've talked about ridge flow, we've talked about pattern area, we've talked about um, identifying type lines and deltas. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about how to figure out where the fingerprint's core is, and then how we can use that, coupled with the location of the delta, to figure out what the fingerprint's ridge count is. And if you remember, when we were talking about fingerprint uh, loops, we said that there's three qualifications for a loop. A loop must have a sufficient recurve, it must have a delta, and it must have at least a ridge count of one. And so uh, it's important that we correctly identify the core because we're going to line up the core and the delta to figure out fingerprint ridge count. So let's talk about the core. In a fingerprint, the core is the approximate center of the pattern area. Uh, and to find the core, especially in a loop, you have to find the innermost uh, recurving ridge or the innermost uh, sufficient recurve. So we're, we're looking at recurves that are good, not spoiled ones. Remember, a recurving ridge is one that flows in from one side of the print and then does a recurve or a U-turn and flows back out the same side of the print. And remember, the recurves can come in from either the right side or the left-hand side of the print. And so here we have two different loops. One is a, a left side loop or a loop where the recurves come in from the left and then go out the left. Or here we have recurving ridges that come in from the right side. So again, this is a, a right side loop or um, a loop where the ridges come in from the right, recurve, and curve out the right hand side. So now the core of a fingerprint on a loop is placed uh, upon or within the innermost sufficient recurve. So we've got to use those rules about figuring out whether a recurve is good or not because we've got to find the innermost sufficient recurve. Now the core on the fingerprint is located on the shoulders of the innermost sufficient recurve and it's located specifically on the shoulder that's farthest from the delta. So before we locate the core we have to first locate uh, where the delta is. So for example in, in, our, in our examples here we can see that here is our type line and here's a type line and so uh, in the point of divergence we find this dot so here's our delta here. Here's our innermost recurve and so we have two shoulders. We have a shoulder here and a shoulder here. We place the core on the shoulder farthest from the delta. So our core is going to be placed here. Same thing here. Here's our innermost recurve. Our delta is over here on the right. And so we're going to put the core on this shoulder of the innermost or sufficient recurve. Uh, on this one, here's our type line, our other type line. So here on this dot is our delta. Here's our innermost recurve. And so we put the core on the shoulder farthest from the delta. Again, here's our type line. Our type line, here's our innermost recurve. We put the core on the shoulder farthest from the delta, which is on this point on that short ridge there. Um, now, what if your innermost recurve has a spike on the inside of it? We can see that these ones, the innermost recurve, there's no ending ridge or spiking ridge in the middle. But what if our innermost recurve has a spike? Well, if there is a spike on the inside of the innermost recurve, or what we'd call a rod on the inside of the innermost recurve, then the core is placed on the end of that spike or rod. So here we have, um, here is our type line. Here's our other type line. So here's our point of divergence. So here's our delta. On this recurve, we have this spike or rod here. And so instead of putting the core on one of the shoulders, we put the core on the end of that spike. Again, another example, here's our type line, our type line, here's our delta at the end of this short ridge. Because we have a spike or rod on the inside of the recurve, we put the core not on the shoulder, but on the end of that uh, rod or spike. Now, what if we have more than one rod or spike on the inside of the recurve? Well, if there's an even number of spikes on the inside of the recurve, then we put the core on the one that is, if they're of the same height, then we put it on the one that's farthest from the delta. So if there are an even number of spikes or rods as high as the shoulders inside the innermost sufficient recurve, choose the two innermost spikes or rods and place the core on the one that is farthest from the delta. So looking at this first example, here is our type line, our type line, and our delta. Looking at our uh, recurve here, we have two spikes that are both as high as the shoulders. So then of the two, we choose the one that is farthest from the delta. So we put it right there on the top of this one. 
looking at this one here, so here we have a type line, a type line, so here's our delta. Notice in our core here we have several spikes that are as high as the shoulders. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we choose the two innermost ones, and then we put it on the top of the one farthest from the, of the two innermost ones, the one farthest from the delta. So our core would go there. All right. Well, what happens if we have an odd number of spikes on the inside of the innermost recurve? Well, that's simple. We simply put it on the top of the of the very middle spike in the middle of the uh, sufficient recurve. So again. Here is our type line, our type line, and our delta. We have our innermost recurve. We can see that there's three spikes in the middle of our recurve, so we put the one on the top of the very middle one. So those are the rules for placing the core uh, in our fingerprint. So that's how we figure out where the core is. So now, how do we figure out a fingerprint's ridge count? All right, so to obtain a fingerprint's ridge count, you draw an imaginary line from the delta to the fingerprint core. So, and then each ridge that that imaginary line crosses is then counted. So you can see why it's so important when we're looking at fingerprint features that we correctly identify the type lines and that we correctly utilize our rules to identify the exact location of the delta. It's important then to use our rules to indicate the exact location of the core because then we're going to draw an imaginary line between those two points and then any line uh, or any ridge rather that that imaginary line crosses is counted and then that number becomes our fingerprint ridge count. Um, in order for a fingerprint to have a ridge count uh, one of the ridges must be a recurving ridge. That's an important point to remember and it's important to remember also when doing a ridge count that we do not include the delta or the core in the ridge count. All right, a couple of rules to remember also. If as you're drawing your imaginary line from your delta to your core, if your imaginary line crosses a bifurcation, uh, if it crosses where the bifurcation branches or across both parts of the bifurcation, you count both. If it crosses the bifurcation in an area where it hasn't branched, it only counts as one. So you can see some examples there. Now, here's some examples of how to do a ridge count or some ridge counts. So here on this fingerprint, we see here's our type lines, and here's our delta. We can see that there's an innermost recurve. There's no spikes, so we would place our core on the outer shoulder. So then if we draw an imaginary line between the delta and the core, remember we don't count the delta or the core, so our imaginary line then basically only crosses one ridge. Remember, it has to cross at least one recurving ridge, and so this fingerprint has a ridge count of only one. Looking at this fingerprint, again, we have our type lines and our delta. Here is our innermost recurve. We can see, though, that there is a spike, and that spike goes as high as the two shoulders. So we put our core at the top of the spike. So if we draw an imaginary line between the delta and the core, we count, again, we don't count the delta, we don't count the core. So we can see that it crosses one, two ridges. So we can see that that fingerprint has a ridge count of two. All right, looking at this fingerprint, again, we first find our type lines. We locate our delta here. We locate our core by first finding that we have an, uh, our sufficient innermost recurve. We can see we have a spike, so we put the core at the top of that spike. When we draw an imaginary line between our delta and our core, we can see that it crosses one, two, three ridges. Again, we don't count the core or the delta, so again, one, two, three. So we see that this fingerprint has a ridge count of three. Looking at this bottom one here, here is our type line, our type line, so then here's our delta. We can see uh, our uh, innermost uh, recurve here. Notice that this recurve is spoiled, so our innermost recurve is actually this one. But then we have a spike in the middle of that, so our core actually goes here as opposed to going on one of the shoulders. If we draw an imaginary line between our delta and the core, and then count, it crosses one, two, three, four ridges. Again, we don't include the core or the delta, so we can see that this fingerprint has a ridge count of four. Those ridge counts are important not only because uh, having a ridge count is an important characteristic for a loop, but later on in the semester, when we talk about how to do a Henry system classification, the ridge count becomes a really important part of that as well.
We're going to end this video by talking about the last fingerprint feature that I want to discuss, which are what are called points or Galton points or minutia or ridge characteristics. Uh, when Galton wrote his book Fingerprinting in 1892, uh, he identified points uh, that are found within fingerprints which could be used to actually identify fingerprints. All people have these Galton points in their fingerprints, uh, but it's the location of these points within the fingerprint pattern which is what actually makes them unique. So examples of these points include dots, bifurcations, ending ridges, short ridges, enclosures, islands, and abutting ridges. Uh, all of us have these, so if you were to look at your fingerprints, all of you have uh, bifurcations in your fingerprints or short ridges. It's not having a bifurcation which is unique to your fingerprint. It's where is that particular point found within the fingerprint. So when an examiner compares one fingerprint to another to see if they may be a match, they're looking for these points to make sure that they're in the same location for each fingerprint. Now the number of points necessary to make an identification varies. Uh, oftentimes I've heard numbers like seven, eight, or nine, but every agency is slightly different. But it's most important that you find enough points that you would feel comfortable as an examiner making an identification. I wanted to show you this fingerprint here and show you some examples of some of these points. So for example, remember a bifurcation is a ridge that travels along and then splits into two, kind of like a fork in the road. And we can see there's lots of bifurcations in this fingerprint. In particular, here's a good example here. We can see this ridge traveling along and then we can see that it bifurcates or it splits. So we can see that there's a bifurcation right here. Another bifurcation we can see, there's one right here and there's one right here. There's a bifurcation right here. So actually there's, there's bifurcations all over this fingerprint. An ending ridge is a, is a ridge that travels along and then simply just stops. So for example, we have a bifurcation here, but then if we follow this ridge along, we see that this ridge just basically stops. And so here we have what's called an ending ridge, or sometimes you'll hear them referred to as ridge endings. Here's another ridge. See how it travels along and then notice how it simply just stops? That's another example of an ending ridge. Dots. Dots are exactly what they sound like. They're basically just really teeny tiny ridges that basically just form small little dots. We can see in this fingerprint there are several. There's a dot right here. We can see there's dots here. There's a dot here. There's a dot here. Again, those are examples of dots. A short ridge is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a really short ridge. Here's an example of a short ridge right here. This is just a really short ridge. So here's a short ridge there. An enclosure is an example of a, of a ridge that bifurcates, so it splits into two, and then it closes back off again. So here we have a ridge that's traveling along, and then notice it bifurcates, it splits, but then it closes back off again. And so here we have what's called an enclosure. The next one we've talked about before, remember an abutting ridge is two ridges that intersect at a sort of angle. So here we have a ridge. It's not so much a bifurcation as it is a, an abutting ridge. We can have a ridge that slams into or hits another ridge at an angle. And those, that's an example of an abutting ridge. So all of these are examples of what we call points. All of these are unique. They are what we call individual characteristics. And if you find enough of these points, you could, uh, between a fingerprint found at a crime scene, what we'd call a latent fingerprint, and if you were to compare that to a known fingerprint from a suspect, if we were to find enough points that, 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 are, that coincide between the unknown fingerprint from the crime scene that match the known fingerprint from the suspect, we could say that they match, and we would therefore be able to say that the fingerprint of the crime scene was definitely left there by the suspect's fingers. Uh, this type of, of uh, comparison is what we call second-level detail. First level detail comparison is when we start a comparison, we're looking at what's called first level detail, which is just the type of fingerprint. Uh, we can look at first level detail on this fingerprint by simply figuring out what type of fingerprint it is. We can tell that this fingerprint is a loop. How do we know it's a loop? Because it has the three characteristics of a loop. We can see that it has an innermost sufficient recurve, so we can see that there's at least one good recurve right here. If you remember, the other characteristics of a loop is that it has a delta. Well, here we see, here's a type line. Here's another type line, so there they diverge. And so right here, we have a delta. If we then draw an imaginary line between the delta and the core, remember the core is going to be found either on our innermost recurve or on a spike within the innermost recurve. 
So here we have a spike within our innermost recurve. So we put our core there. If we draw an imaginary line from our delta to our core, we can see that it crosses one, two, three, four, five, six ridges. And so it has a ridge count of six. So this fingerprint has a ridge count of six. It definitely has a recurve and it definitely has a core. Uh, and it has a delta, so this is definitely a loop. So this is a loop. So if the fingerprint at the crime scene was a loop, and then the suspect had a loop, the first thing we look at is just pattern. And if, if the pattern is the same, we call that first level detail. Second level detail is when we're comparing the actual points. So if I was looking at the fingerprint from the crime scene, and I could see that the fingerprint from the crime scene or the unknown print had a bifurcation right here, and then I was looking at the suspect's fingerprint, and I could see that that suspect's fingerprint also had a bifurcation right there, that's one point. And if I could see that there was an ending ridge just above it, and then a dot, and then two more above that, another bifurcation, if all of those points matched between the unknown and the known, that would be enough for me to say it was a match. There's actually a third level of detail we can look at, and it's our final feature we want to talk about, which is poor patterns. And really, really good fingerprints, ones that are perfect or pristine, when we look at them, we can actually see what's called third level detail. And third level detail is actually, we can actually see the individual, see those little dots here? We can actually see the individual pores in the skin and the spacing of these pores and their size, coupled also with the shape of the ridge itself. Notice how some of these ridges get fat and then skinny and then fat and skinny. So the shape of the ridges themselves and the spacing of those individual skin pores is also a unique feature we, we, which we can compare. That's called third level detail. The only problem with doing fingerprint comparisons with third level detail is normally uh, the fingerprints are sometimes a little bit smudged or smeared and we can't normally see that that good a detail. And so normally when we're doing a comparison we're only looking at second level detail. We're looking at those, those Galton points or those minutia points like dots, bifurcations, and ending ridges. So anyway, that's uh, our final video on fingerprint features.